Um, so we're gonna start uh, so we can end early because I know everyone is tired. Um, and yes, let us begin. Uh, cool, so we're gonna talk about uh, our Skeletor scaffolding. Um, I'm gonna go into introductions and everything later, but first off, I'm gonna show you what we're actually gonna be building. Um, so our goal for this presentation is right now to show you how we build um, a progressively decoupled application into your own workflow using real world, world examples and tools that uh, Yoshi and I actually use in production. So what it is, -da, um, and there's a little bit of a live demo here, so it's risky, but uh, what's life without some risk into it? So we have here is a uh, little application where we'll be able to dynamically show attendees um, at a conference. And this application here is React. So this is my React inspector. Uh, if I refresh the page, there should be a little flash of loading and then it dynamically loads the user. Um, this is just a card, simple, simple. When I edit the card, so I have the attendee, it has the title, it has their first name, it has a bio in some language I don't know, which is many languages. I'm gonna save it. And then this is gonna dynamically update. So we're getting live information from Drupal. So I removed the DrupalCon, therefore it, the demo worked um, here. And uh, what we're doing here is specifically using a React component within Drupal um, and building out uh, an architecture to meet some uh, specific challenges. The challenges that we're trying to face, this is very weird. Um, again, as I said before the first one, we're gonna build it so that there's a React component inside of Drupal. This isn't gonna be two separate decoupled environments. These are gonna, it's called, again, progressively decoupled. So it's within Drupal. You'll have the Drupal page that provides a uh, React application, specifically in this context. Um, and here, we wanna have one of the challenges that we wanna meet is that we have a front-end team um, that is using React and a back-end team that is using Drupal. And they don't like each other. They wanna have separate repositories, separate code bases, so that they can iterate and build on it at their own pace. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we also wanna have confidence in our React components. So with Drupal, we're used to unit testing, we're used to behavioral testing, and in React, we wanna have the same level of testing and security too. So given the fact that that's our end goal, that we wanna have this little application of cards to come out, we wanna meet these challenges, how are we gonna actually do it? And so for this presentation, we're gonna talk about how we do that uh, over four topics. We wanna look at how we actually build a progressively decoupled site with our framework called Skeletor, and it is open source and available, so you can go and read all my spelling mistakes in code. Um, we're gonna see how we can do in continuous integration in a progressively decoupled environment. So as each team makes its change, they're able to pull in the most recent version of the other team's work. Um, we're gonna look at unit testing React components within Drupal. So as I build out the uh, Drupal artifact or the final build artifact, we're gonna have the unit tests run alongside us. And then finally, uh, we're gonna test for data consistency using uh, what's called a JSON schema, which allows us to define the structure of our APIs. So given that this is, that, this is the presentation, um, if that's not your cup of tea, cool. If it is, we hope you stay and enjoy the ride. So I talked a bit. Um, I'm Aaron Marchak. I am a Associate Director of Drupal Practices at MyPlanet. We're a uh, web agency out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, so there's a little bit of time difference. Um, I've been doing a handful of other presentations and work within Drupal 8 for the past few years, and I'm really excited to help uh, show and promote the progressively decoupled approach, because I believe that that's a lot of strength uh, that it provides developers, so that they can pick and choose uh, which tools they want for the best projects. And my lovely presentation partner. Hi, everybody. I'm Yuri Savenko, and uh, I'm using, usually I'm using my nickname Yoshi. I am solution architect at MyPlanet, and I'm doing actually both Drupal and JavaScript, mostly JavaScript right now, and running some small JavaScript practice group in my company. And yeah, that's me. 
<laughs> cool. So uh, we will have our Twitter at the end of this. If you guys have any questions, there will be time at the end of this presentation for questions. Or if you have something that wakes you up in the middle of the night and you're like, they never answered that, you can always reach out to us. Um, these slides are available now um, at the very, very, very tiny URL at the top at emarchak.com uh, slash Skeletor dash scaffolding. So if you want to follow along, you should be able to follow that on your mobile if you want, or uh, download it later. So cool. Out of the four topics, uh, let's get started on the first one. So I'm going to talk about how we actually build um, a progressive decoupled site with Skeletor. Skeletor is our scaffolding framework um, for actually building decoupled apps. So what the heck is this, what, what, what is this scaffolding framework? What is this you are asking yourself? Um, what it is, it's very similar to how um, Drupal Composer has built itself out. And we use a lot of the patterns and uh, behaviors from there in here. Uh, it is essentially a, a Drupal install profile that allows you to create and build your own um, Drupal dock root using Drupal 8. Uh, the reason why we use scaffolding instead of such as a distribution or an installation profile is that working with the clients that we do, we tend to find that a lot of the challenges that we have uh, on projects are unique and one-off, and we usually need to override, extend, or manipulate code. So something that's a scaffolding that gives you a foundation to build on top of, that you can edit, you can adjust the foundation, you can remove or add each time, gives us more flexibility you know, than what we need. So it's available on uh, Packagist. You can use it to download, and you're like, what does this look like? Um, this is my local environment where I'm running it. Uh, so you can see here I have Skeletor. And what this does is, is it scaffolds out a dock root for you. Um, within there, there are some uh, bits of magic that we like to use. There's a few hooks. We have a few scripts uh, that are specific for us that I'll get into and show you how they help us to progressively decouple our site. Boop. So within Skeletor Scaffold, and one of the key components of actually building out this decoupled uh, framework that we have is uh, REST UI and JSON schema. And I'm going to go into those individually. And they're both contributed modules. They're available on Drupal.org, and I like them a lot. Um, and what uh, they do, respectively, is one provides an interface to manage and control endpoints that are available and configurable through Drupal core. And the other one provides us a schema to describe it. And I'll show you how we can uh, use that later on. So within REST UI, as I said here, um, it provides an interface for configuring Drupal's eight Drupal 8's REST module. Now that's in core, so that comes out of the box. And you can see here on my site, uh, this is the REST resources. It's under uh, admin, config, services, REST. And all this does is provide an interface for you to point and click your way to worldly success and fortune and fame. Um, but within here, I can enable and disable a lot of the different endpoints that are by default provided by core. And if I choose to add my own, you'll be able to see that in here. And all that I've done for this example is I've enabled the node endpoint. Um, I've enabled the get parameter so I can get the node and I can read it. And again, uh, if you're coming in here later on, what we're going to be doing is bop, bop. I have a little React application here for presenters that is within a Drupal site that allows us to consume these endpoints. So uh, from the REST resources, I enable my content endpoint on the REST UI. And I'm flipping over to what's called Postman. And it allows me to just read the nodes in an endpoint in a reasonable way. And so I've enabled the uh, node type. Again, this is no configuration outside of just core and enabling it through REST UI. I get this lovely uh, endpoint that describes my node and provides all sorts of different information. So if you've come to any of my previous presentations, I've normally spoken about how you can configure your own endpoints. If you're just trying to test this out, uh, REST UI and the core REST module at this point is fine to use, but you can also choose to extend it if you want. Cool. So that's REST. Uh, there it is. There's the little slide that I talked about. The second one that I mentioned is uh, JSON schema. And what this does is it allows us to generate a schema which describes our endpoints. And what this does is it, we can then connect it to open APIs, or we can use it to provide um, syntactical information for the endpoints. Um, open APIs 
is um, their goal is to create an open description format for API services that is vendor neutral, portable, and open. Uh, they believe that that is critical to accelerating the vision of a truly connected world, if you couldn't read that. Um, but the point of this is, is that it is an endpoint that is agnostic to any application that describes the UI, or sorry, that describes the interface uh, for the endpoint. So it's giving structural information to React, to Angular, to your phone application, if you're using to consume those endpoints, so they can understand what you're actually trying to send through the nodes. So we've enabled JSON schema. And you can see here at the other endpoint that I have pulling. Oh, thanks, Postman. That's, that's helpful. That's great. Um, but you can see here, this is the actual endpoint that JSON uh, schema provides, which you can then connect up to the open API. And all that does is it provides a schema, description, and object here. So it's, again, describing a payload for the node entities of the attendee bundle. So within those two modules, when we have a slide describing it, we've described and provided information regarding our attendees. So we now have something that a uh, connected application can look at, understand what the payload is going to be for the nodes or for the attendees, and then actually get the payload itself. So great, job one done, awesome. All I had to do was enable two modules, easy peasy, I can go along in my Drupal universe and keep on coding. Now again, the other challenge was, is that we wanted to have a decoupled application or a progressively decoupled application but I wanted to make sure that I'm able to integrate each change that the React team does during each build of my process. Um, and I want it in one doc root. I don't want to have to have multiple hosts. I don't want to have to deal with multiple server configurations. In the end, the React application is JavaScript. I just want to call JavaScript and then download it and then like not, anyway, I get upset when I have to do a lot of work. Um, so my goal for this step is to, all I want to do is say composer require um, and then the module name. And we call this uh, Skeletor Scaffold. And this is a uh, package on Drupal.org that allows us to then attach NPM packages within our uh, application. So what I'm going to be doing is using composer to fetch my node application, download it, and install it. So all I have to do is run that. So how does this actually work? Um, if you go to Skeletor Scaffold, here, um, this is a separate, it's just a Drupal module, boop, boop. Um, and what this does is it provides basic scaffolding. And again, this is open source, you can look at it and insult my naming conventions, that's fine. Um, what this does is it's just a Drupal module, and it allows us to download uh, NPM dependencies. And how you actually download, so you're like, how do I use Composer, which is a PHP dependency manager, to download Node, which is a JavaScript dependency manager. They're two separate languages. Hold on to your pants. Um, so what you can do is register your custom package within your composer.json. Now, Drupal already does this. It registers its own custom repository here. And again, I'm just looking at our core. Hey, ooh, wrong button. Um, I'm just looking at the core composer.json file. Um, and you can see here under repositories, by default, we register uh, packages.drupal.org. And that's uh, composer registry. What I'm going to do next is then register my own NPM package, which is my custom um, repo that is the code base that all of the uh, node developers are going to be handling. And I register that within my repositories in my uh, composer.json file. So you can see here I name it, I give it a version, I give it a custom type, which is we call npm package, and then I provide it uh, git information. We're going to be using the presentation branch here, and then I have the URL to the direct repository. Um, one of the reasons why we're able to actually have a custom type so again, npm package. If you're used to Composer, you'll see stuff like Drupal module or theme. We're creating our own one here. Um, to create your own one, you need to include Composer installers extender. And what this does here is it allows us to declare our own installer types. The installer types, it's later on in the composer.json. You can see here, we've registered npm package. And that's it. It allows us to, and I say that's it. Um, it allows us to then, when we see something called an NPM package, 
we download it, again we've declared what this is, and we say I want to put this in my doc root alongside my modules. And I want to install it here. And it's the same pattern that Drupal uses, where is it here? You can see here, uh, type Drupal library, I want to install it where my library should be. Type Drupal profile, I want to install it where my profile should be. Type npm package, I want to install it where my npm packages should be. So what we've done, and you can choose to pick this anywhere you want, is I have under my modules directory, I have my npm packages. And that's just where my node is. So from this, and all we've done, there's nothing edited or custom in the node package. If you wanted to, you could include um, a composer.json in your node package, but I've talked to the React guys and they're like, don't touch my node work, it's mine. Um, so fine, I handle it here. And then I'm able to pull it in and download it. The floor is now closed. So I've downloaded the node package, but how do I install it? Because again, I'm very lazy and I don't want to do anything more than just that one require. Again, uh, shockingly, all we have to do is play around in composer.json and add what's called um, an additional script. Now, if you've used a uh, node before, you're probably familiar with post install hooks. Um, other dependency managers have that. But what we're able to do is chain commands that are done after each um, process. So we've created or we've registered a special command. Again, this is why we have our Skeletor, so we can extend work. And we have a command that explicitly tries to run npm install. We've registered that. And then as composer, I can run npm install. I can run npm build. And I attach that to my post install command. So when composer installs, and you can have a build, nee, nee, nee. you can have a build, you can have an update. There's a handful of these before. It's really, really extensible. But all I have to do is run composer npm install. And then it goes through and it actually creates or fetches, not fetches, it runs npm install for you. Now, to create these little commands, uh, we have to actually write them in PHP. Thank goodness, that's what I prefer to write. Boop. And we have them, again, this is available from Skeletor. We have them in npm package. And you just create your own specific class. It extends it out. And I register different commands here. And again, if you want to look at this and play around with it, all this code is available online. So I'm actually able to run different commands. And I use different... Um, libraries that are available to me to find the Drupal root, to crawl through it, to fetch different things uh, that are the NPM packages, and then actually run the command itself. And then from there, what this does is when I run composer install, it looks at my module, it sees that I have a uh, custom package, that is my node package, it fetches that, it downloads all of the dependencies, and after a post install hook, it runs npm install npm build, and so it means that all I have to do is composer, dot, or composer install to run, and this is our Travis instance. Nee, nee, nee. It actually runs composer.install by itself, if you can see it there, and then you have all of the lovely output of npm install. Fantastic. But it means that as a PHP developer, I don't need to learn anything new. Um, once this is set up, your team can just run Composer install. You can, you're off to the races. Um, and what it does is, additionally to installing everything through Node, it actually allows us to run tests. And it allows the Node team to go through and run the tests. It passes. And then I can deploy this up to my hosting provider. So by using Composer, and Composer install hooks and the packages really, really elegantly, I'm able to just run Composer install and fetch a node package, build it, and run it out. So you're like, that's great. That's amazing. How do we actually then test the uh, React packages? That's my question. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk today about two things about React and uh, <clears throat> particularly about how do we do unit tests like, in our teams and how do we connect 
like React applications and Drupal even better by using JSON schemas? And where do you, like, where's the use case for that? Um, I, I'm not really sure if I need to, like, explain a little bit what React is, uh, but can you guys raise your hand, like, if you, if you work with React or work on it? So I, I think pretty, pretty many people. So, and speaking about React, I particularly will be speaking about uh, React Redux application because we use Redux for our state management. And uh, we can go to, to the next slide. Uh, so when building tests, uh, first of all, we need to identify what are the moving parts in our applications and where the problem may be, may appear. So we can identify like three main things or three main sections in our Re React applications, which are components, potentially user interact with them and something may happen. We, wa we want to make sure that component renders correctly every time. Uh, we have actions. It's specific to Redux, but uh, anyways, actions is like probably one of the most important parts where the business logic may live in our React applications. And uh, we want to make sure that, uh, and whenever action has been dispatched, which means like so something happened, like something changed, we want to make sure that uh, nothing broken. So we want to cover that with tests. And we have reducers, which technically it's, uh, it's a thing which controls, which it's a function which controls the, our application state. And we want to make sure that in the reaction to the particular action dispatch we want, like our reducers update our application state correctly. Uh, and I think I will jump to the uh, next session, uh, next slide and what recommendations and what are we using, what tools are we using. Uh, we use Jest. Uh, there is a quote you can read. Uh, I, I just steal it from the Facebook page. Uh, but basically, it's a test runner. We, we use it just as a test runner for a couple of like, reasons. It's, it's very simple configuration. They claim it's a zero configuration. It's really possible to run it with a zero configuration, just install, and start writing the tests. And it's really buying, like, whatever Facebook mentioned at the very beginning, or at the, at the very end, it's something like at the end of writing oh yeah provided with ready tool and developers end up writing more tests which turns result in more stable and healthy code bases so simple configuration snapshot testing it it's a tool we use from time to time but basically it's, it's really really nice can speed up the process uh, for you uh, just as fast by parallelizing, it's a claim from them, but basically we, we experienced it, it's pretty good. And it has built-in coverage reports. Sometimes, probably like for clients and even for yourself, we will see the results right now and uh, it's important to see what the coverage. Uh, we also use Enzyme. Uh, it's, it's a JavaScript testing utility and it, Basically, we, we picked it for a couple of reasons. It's jQuery-like API. It's easy to write selectors. Whatever is rendered by the, by the React, it's easy to define. Uh, and the second one is shallow rendering, which allows us to build effective like, unit tests, test specific, particularly those components who want to test and do not bother about any side effects introduced by child components. And I will go through the couple of code samples. I did simplify it a little bit, our oh, like example uh, component, and and this code overall to fit the screen. Uh, but on the left, you can see the pretty simple component. Uh, basically, it this component what what you saw Aaron presented. It's like a small tile which shows the presenter at the moment. Uh, so. And on the right, you have, we have a test for it. It's like, this was this test was just making sure that component renders properly. We mock some data on the input, we render a component, we pass some props, 
into a component, and when I can show that like, uh, expected content, which which should appear on the on the component renders correctly, and there is some action. I posted here example of asynchronous uh, of of the test for the for the action which has an asynchronous request to the uh, server. So again, this action, if we go from top to the bottom, it dispatch one action to show some, like, to inform application that I'm gonna start fetching the data, this get data, get data pending. So probably you want to show some sort of trouble or indicate that request is gonna be sent. Uh, we use access to send the actual request to, to the particular URL, get response, uh, validate. I will, I will attach these two lines in the, in the next section for the JSON schema. And if our response has been validated successfully, we want to dispatch successful, like we want to dispatch data with successful response, otherwise we may report about error. So it's a pretty simple scenario. And on the right, you can see test file. Uh, what we do over here is basically we mock the response instead of, we, we just say to access, hey, access if uh, test is gonna send the request to this URL, do not do it and respond to some mocked response. So this allow us to unit test with particular action and to compare at the end. Our, whatever I selected is expected actions uh, should be dispatched by, by this particular action and we just assert if uh, those action were dispatched. And example test for the reducer. So reducer is, is just a pure function. It's much easier to test. So I don't think I will, I, I will go pretty, pretty quickly through, through the step. So the, the purpose of the reducer is to check if some action has been dispatched and update its own portion of the state. And that's basically what we try to mimic with, with our unit test. We have, uh, we just mock some uh, action, we, we just dispatched it, and at the end we do whatever should happen in the reducer, we just assemble the same same data structure and compare it with whatever returned by the, by the reducer. Uh, and the test results. So you, you saw it from the Aaron's presentation. I just took a small portion of it. So you can see our three example tests we saw on the previous screen run successfully. Uh, this one is unsuccessful and just will just in, will inform you what happened. For example, in, in this case, uh, expected uh, name which appears on the card was not, was not rendered correctly. And this is how it, uh, test coverage looks like. We have a couple of tests, so again, everything of this can be run, can, can be started with a, with a compo composer, but uh, and we actually do it coverage properly. It's up to your discretion to do. And a summary. So just quick overview what we have seen. We unit tested three main moving parts of our React applications, uh, application, which are components, actions, and reducers. And we saw the coverage report. And we can move to, move to another part, or second part, which is JSON schema. So Aaron mentioned about that, and from the React point, like I consider it's quite important because React by itself relies on the da data structure Drupal return to React as in in a request, and it's it, it's it's an area where where the problems may appear. So, we, 
as a React application on the React side, on front-end side, we do not have control of, uh, of the data structure, which has returned to us. So we need to find the way, how can we <coughs> early like, report about this problem and do not discover it on a particular component, or maybe on, in every component check, like is, is object has, has a particular property, we can do it with JSON schema. And just a short quote, what JSON schema is, is vocabulary that allows you to annotate and validate JSON documents, which is a mentor for us. And like, I quickly outlined the problem, what do we want to, to do and where the problem comes from. Like, uh, JavaScript is not strongly typed language. And if, let's say, Drupal returned to you string instead of integer, you may you may want you may want to do additional validation and additional work and maybe if that happens after your react application finished like if drupal returns you some invalid data like you even would not notice that react doesn't render on the front end i mean on the production so we suggest json schemas there are a couple of uh, javascript implementations for the JSON schema validators, I printed seven. Uh, there is a link at the bottom uh, with a little bit more, but yeah. Uh, what are we using? We use AGV, and uh, we find it like uh, pretty good. Usually, it appears on top of like benchmarks, and uh, it, it's pretty informative in case of what data, what, what uh, errors that does it report to us, if, if any found. And on the screen, I will show you, like, this is a small example. Properly on the left-hand side, you, you will not see such a clean result from the Drupal, like, out of the box, or maybe, not, maybe you can. Uh, but uh, this is a sample of JSON, which potentially return to the React from, from the Drupal uh, backend, as a backend. And on the right, you can see, uh, again, it's a JSON schema file. Uh, and we're going to validate our response against this schema. So uh, what does it mean? It's uh, like we expect to see an object in the response, which has a properties. And properties are ID title, first name, last name, bio, and presenter. And each of this property has, has a particular type. It's like type integer for ID or presenter should be Boolean. And we expect like ID, first name, and last name to be required fields. So if, for example, first name is missed or ID was not returned, uh, we should consider the response is invalid. And this is an example, I just returned back, you saw this uh, action creator, but uh, basically on these two lines, we uh, just take the schema, like particularly compile it, make and validate our response, which appears in the res data against the JSON schema. If something goes wrong, we can gracefully fail application, in our case, just dispatch a message and submit the validate errors to our, to our like, yep, our, as, as a payload for our action. Or you can, like, if everything okay, you just go ahead and, and, and continue rendering the stuff. And to summarize, so we have, like, we just see on the one example how we use JSON schemas and how it can be used. There are more, obviously. You can um, make your React application, like, which was not an example, you can make your uh, React application validate the data prior submitting it back to Drupal. So if you post something, or yeah, basically if you post something back to the Drupal, probably you want to do the same to make sure that data has been assembled in the proper format and you should use a separate validate, like separate JSON schema file for that and validate the data against it. 
uh, you can make your React application report back to like to Drupal and uh, about the problem. So, for example, on the previous slide, uh, we submit the the validation error as a payload. So technically, if it's reported to Drupal on the Drupal side, you can decide what to do. Maybe on your production project, something broken, your Drupal will return, will update the log, and you, it may notify the, some key person, key How people. How you suggest my Drupal site is broken? Did I say Drupal? I'm sorry. React application is <laughs> broken. <laughs> um, you can, yeah, you can validate, you, you can massage, massage some data. So let's say if some data conversion is possible, this is a tr tricky area, but sometimes, sometimes it's doable. So let's say all you need to do, you just need to convert string to integer. You can do it, revalidate your, like your updated payload you've got from the, from the Drupal. Or if validation happens, okay, you probably may want to continue rendering your React application. And uh, I think, yeah. And just just to mention about like JavaScript uh, like types, uh, consider using the prop types. It it doesn't help you on the production project, but it will help you during development, informing that something got in the in the improper format. So let's say same ID you've got as a string in the console log, you will be reported about this problem. Uh, yeah, cool. here so, we go. Uh, we kind of powered through a lot of that. Uh, in the end, uh, we do think it's really important that the uh, Drupal, if you're building any form of decoupled, whether it's fully decoupled or progressively decoupled, working together as a team between the individual development teams is really important, especially in terms of validation of data, because when data is being translated across the systems, that's when it can get wrong, it can get manipulated, it can uh, be risk of attack if you're doing anything secure. So using Drupal to provide a schema so that React can expect um, certain forms of validation is really important. Um, the other side of that is that um, some questions that we would want to consider is does it make sense for the server to send information to React describing its own data structure when the server's rendering it? Or should React be defining the schema itself? So React defines what it should be expecting from the server. Yep. And Drupal should expect what should it return in, should it get in return, Because right? mm -hmm. mm -hmm. essentially that's the, um, the Rosetta Stone, the schema, is the Rosetta Stone of the translation of the endpoints to each other. It's a way of communicating what's there, how it's kind of formed, and how you can actually structure it properly. Um, yep. Another point that, uh, for the future, um, is that I showed you how to download a, a custom repository using Composer. If you have many of those, it can get really overwhelming and your composer file can get really, really big. Uh, one of the options that you can do is host your own private packages. So in the same way that perhaps Drupal is not on the general packages, which is the PHP repository, um, you can provide your own packages for your team. So if you have private packages, if you have private dependencies, if you want to control your own structure and then distribute it out, there, out through that, uh, you can do that uh, for yourself. So if you want to have different um, node packages that uh, PHP developers can pull in and build, you can do that quite easily by just declaring them in your own private packages. Uh, and then finally, there's been a lot of playing around uh, with different node environments, whether it's uh, decoupled or fully decoupled, progressively decoupled. The, one of the barriers that we're finding is that people have to deal with so many new tools. Um, going with progressively decoupled allows PHP developers to kind of bring React and everything into their own ecosystem. Yep. If you're looking at introducing a new technology to your team, um, maybe try to choose the way that is the least invasive. I know that Acquia and potentially Pantheon are playing around with using their own node hosting uh, providers. So if you could introduce node in a way that allows teams to use their own hosting, their existing development tools, that's another way to kind of lower the barrier. So you can start having these cool conversations and this really exciting synergy that you can get uh, within Drupal. Yep. Cool.
So as I promised, we started on time, and hopefully we're ending a bit early. It is the last session. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants us to go over anything, because I know that was a really very fast for the end of the DrupalCon, um, please come up and let us know. Uh, can you come up to the mic, because it is recorded, please? Um, other than that, if you want to tweet me or my planet, and therefore get Yoshi, because he doesn't like technology, no. that's a lie, um, you can reach me uh, at emarchak or my planet at, at my planet, and we can continue the conversation. So uh, how long uh, did it take you to develop this uh, solution, let's say, to, to get to a product you can use as a framework for uh, your uh, projects? Um, we've been using the Skeletor system, so again, just deciding that we would prefer scaffolding over uh, building on distributions. Uh, we've been using that for over a year, um, just again, spinning it up, and every time that we find a tweak or an adjustment, we bring that in and add that to the next project, so it's kind of evolving through time. Um, a lot of it is based on the principles and the patterns that are, are defined in the uh, Drupal Composer repository, so using those post-install hooks to manipulate files and using that, uh, we borrowed from a lot of different things and we're really inspired by the work of the community from there. So I would say we're not there yet, it's still evolving, but it's something that you can look at, hopefully you can fork and steal the good ideas and let us know which ideas uh, you would like to contribute back. I'll contribute, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the React components. Uh, yeah, in, it, it's pretty similar. It's, it's real hard to track any like involvement of the project because we usually discover something during the production work with it and <coughs> return it back to, like in, in case of React, it's usually uh, reusable components. We would like to speed up our process for the future so we create a repo of reusable components we, like, we will use. So yeah, but initially it looks like it's not that hard, but eventually it, like, it's more and more time invested into it, so yeah. And I think with these uh, decoupled approaches, you're seeing a lot of repeated code. It's a lot of, uh, again, structures that are redefined and you reuse throughout projects, especially on React components. So looking for ways that you can avoid writing the same boilerplate code that you have every time is really helpful, whether you're optimizing for components, whether you're reusing uh, installation scripts with Composer, uh, focusing on that to try and make sure that the developers are not just sitting there typing boilerplate is really, really important. Anything else? That answers question. <laughs> cool. Well, we ended a bit early, but then that means everyone can go out and check out the uh, closing comments. So thank you very much. Thank you. We didn't speak for a Yeah. Oh, Very and uh, finally, I'm sure you've heard this before, because I'm assuming this is not your first session. Uh, you can find this presentation and these slides at the URL uh, on events.drupal.org. And please take the Survey Monkey survey to give feedback for our presentation and DrupalCon Vienna, because we want to know we want them to know that we really like DrupalCon Europe.